Hey, welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Dr. Bentley here. I'm the dermatologist at Veterinary Referral Center of Central Oregon. And I have Dr. Pinella also with me today to talk about food toxicities. Um, and if you haven't seen Dr. Pinella's lecture on, um, what did you do? A fox, cheat grass, cheat yeah, grass yeah, and foxtails. Yeah. That one was really, really good. Um, some good prevention strategies there too. So check that out. Um, but I know everyone kind of knows chocolate of course is toxic to dogs um so and there was a really good video also on that by dr uh taylor as taylor stockdale and she did a whole thing about chocolate toxicity so check that one out too but we're going to talk about everything else that's food related that can be toxic to dogs and also our cats so what else is there besides chocolate? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, this isn't going to be all extensive, but at least some of the more common ones that we see and, and some of the common culprits we actually see are uh, fruits and vegetables, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the most common kind of fruit vegetable toxicities that we see is are actually grapes and raisins. Um, yeah. So some fruits and vegetables are good snacks to give to your dogs but we're going right. to cover some of the some of the ones that might not be so good so. yeah and i always you know people are like oh yeah just take a grape it's so easy to just like flick it up and pop it into a dog's mouth yeah. like as a simple little treat but they're i heard they're they're super toxic so what exactly is causing this toxicity in grapes what does it do yeah the the jury's kind of still out on what actually is the toxic principle with grapes and so they, they've tried to do a lot of research whether it's like a mycotoxin or some other type of, of toxin haven't been able to really pinpoint it they do know that it's not necessarily um the seed because even seedless grapes can cause toxicity and a lot of raisins are obviously seedless as well so um yeah they what they can cause is acute kidney injury and even sometimes kidney failure um and so they, they can cause pretty severe disease um and it's not always that somebody you know fed their dog a bunch of grapes um a lot of times what we see is they got into something that had a lot of raisins in them that was baked yeah. like oatmeal raisin cookies sometimes have a, yeah. right, have a high concentration um of raisins or like chocolate covered raisins that kind of thing um, where it, it may end up, depending on the situation, that the, the raisin actually causes more problems than the chocolate itself, the okay. milk chocolate, but um, yeah. And then grapes and raisins, the toxicity is a little bit different. It's not dose dependent, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a really good point. So with most of our toxins we look at, you know, they're kind of concentration dependent. So in other words, if, if a dog, a small dog eats a large quantity, they're going to be more prone to symptoms than if a large dog eats the same quantity. Whereas with grapes and raisins, it's, there's a wide variety of how different dogs respond to, to that dose. So, um, you know, a big dog that's reactive to it for whatever reason, we don't really know, may eat a small handful of grapes or raisins and have pretty serious wow. clinical signs. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, maybe, maybe if they ate one, it's, you can almost guarantee it's not going to cause a problem. Um, but I would still, um, contact poison control, you know, if they only eat a small amount just to make sure or call your uh, veterinarian. So, okay. And is it something where you eat the grapes or eat the raisins, the owners at home and they're like, well, the dog seems okay. Or is it something where it's like, okay, you eat those raisins, you should probably get on poison control and probably get to a veterinarian. Yes, I would say you you don't wanna wait until there are symptoms to make a call. So, you know, sometimes there's, you don't have the control over it. They may be having symptoms and and then you need to, to go try to figure out why and you may find a box of, you know, whatever, be an empty plate of oatmeal raisin, raisin cookies or that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and not know at first, but if you know um, that your dog ingested something concerning, and we can talk about a couple um, of other ones here in a second, then then I think that warrants going ahead and calling. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to let the, the audience know, what, what exactly would be the general treatment for a grape or a raisin toxicity? Yeah, so unfortunately there's not like a specific antidote necessarily, but the, the mainstay of treatment would be IV fluid therapy um, to, to keep the kidneys functioning well, um, to keep the animal well hydrated, Washington. and then really just monitoring um, their kidneys over time and trying to make sure um, that they're not. Sometimes we'll do like activated charcoal to help bind up whatever is okay. left in their system too. So there are certain treatments where I do think it would be worth, you know, having them here if they if they need to be. Right. 
Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, and I guess we can move on other other foods out there yeah. for dogs that are toxic that you at home may may not realize. Yeah. So so if we're sticking with with kind of a fruit fruit and veggies theme, um, onions, garlic, and chives they they're kind of all in this uh, allium family, and they they contain toxins that can cause hemolytic anemias in animals, which essentially is destruction of their own red blood cells, and it can lead to to a low red blood cell count, and they can get quite quite sick. So those are something um, to to look out for if your dog ingests that. Um, avocados, um, it's it, it contains a toxin called persin, the flesh of avocados, but um, usually they have to ingest a relatively high quantity to cause mm -hmm. the symptoms, which is severe vomiting and diarrhea. But it's worth mentioning too that the that the center of an avocado can cause in and of itself like gastrointestinal obstructions, oh, really? that kind of yeah. thing. Um, a couple other ones probably worth mentioning, but are a lot less common would be, um, like ingestion of large amounts of cherries, especially the pits. And if they're chewed up, they do contain cyanide. So they can cause problems. The kind of the fleshier part of the cherry, um, that you would want to eat, uh, does not contain any toxic compounds that I'm aware of, but the pits definitely do. Um, as well as even actually high quantities of apple seeds. Um, and then of course the core of an apple, just like with the center of an avocado could, could cause like an obstructive issue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's a few things out there that I don't yeah. think people would, would expect. And, and you can do like a, the slice of an apple would be fine. Just not the seeds or the core. Right. Yeah, as a snack. And I guess going along those lines, the big one in July are the corn cobs that get stuck. Yes, not necessarily a toxin, but yeah, to that's definitely the apple core line. Definitely <laughs> worth bringing that up as yeah. well. Yeah. No corn cobs. Yeah. And we kind of talked about dogs, but uh, what about cats? Yeah. So most of what we just covered also um, rings true for cats. I think, you know, the, I don't know if there's that much um, covering avocados and cats. I could be wrong there, but um, I know there's definitely evidence to show that both onions and garlic, as well as um, grapes and raisins can cause significant toxicities okay. in, in cats. So um, yeah, I would say echo most of, of what we just talked about for cats, for cats as, well. as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you kind of mentioned it before, um, but the uh, toxin hotline can be mm -hmm. a really good resource. Um, and we can also post that to, to our Facebook page as well to give you that. Um, but can you um, give the owners at home a little bit of um, clarification on exactly what that hotline is and kind of what to expect with it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, the reason we have people people do that is because it's a it's a really timely way to try to get really pertinent advice because they these data centers have collected a lot of data over time of, um, you know, how much response do certain animals have to certain toxins? Mm -hmm. They can give us a really targeted treatment plan. They can give you advice at home on if there's anything you can do, um, you know, other than bringing them in or in certain scenarios, maybe that you don't even need to. Um, but, uh, but they're really helpful. It's worth, usually there's a fee associated with it. Um, I think with the ASPCA poison control, it's $75, but I think for peace of mind, for the most part, it's, it's worth using that resource. And yeah. so I usually recommend people keep the phone number, which like you said, if we could post, but keep the phone number somewhere that's readily accessible, um, whether it be like close to the kitchen where a lot of times these types of things happen or somewhere else that's easy to get to. So Yeah, and it's often something that when people come, we, we actually recommend that you call them um, so that we can get information from those toxic centers. And it, it may seem a little silly, you're going to the vet to, to answer those questions, but you're absolutely right. They have a huge database with different doses, different toxins, and can really um, get us a really good treatment plan to initiate. Now, you see we have a question back there. Yes, we have a question from Shanna, and she would like to know if popcorn is okay to feed to dogs. Yeah, with popcorn, I'd be, you know, as concerned about the the kernels and the butter as I would about anything else. It yeah. probably wouldn't be in the salt. There, I guess there's a, enough of a reason, maybe not a strict toxic compound that I can think of, but but just to steer clear of, of uh, giving that as a regular snack. Um, I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's what I was going <laughs> to yeah. say. Some of the popcorn can be super buttery. And of course yeah. that could, you know, contribute to something called pancreatitis. Um, 
So it may be, you know, a few is going to be fine, but if it's a regular snack right. that we're doing, it might not be the best choice. Correct. Yeah, definitely. So that's a good question. It is. Another one? And she would also like to know if there, um, if just talk about chocolate as well. Talk about chocolate. Mm -hmm. I will refer you to that video because it was absolutely great um, with Dr. Stockdale doing doing that and all things about chocolate. Um, but if you want to kind of give a synopsis yeah, of chocolate, that definitely would be wonderful. Definitely can. Yeah, toxic can be, toxic, chocolate can <laughs> be very dangerous, um, as most people probably know, but some people may not. And um, I think a big thing to drive home about chocolate for people at home is just that um, it, it varies a lot based on one, the quantity, but to the, the potency of the chocolate or the percent of actual um, cocoa that it has in it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so like any kind of dark chocolate or like pure baking chocolate usually has a really high concentration of the dangerous quantities. Milk chocolate actually and certain types of candy like, you know, like Reese's peanut butter cups, stuff like that sometimes actually contains a surprisingly low amount of, of the dangerous compound that chocolate contains. Um, which can cause um, tremors, cardiac arrhythmias, and sometimes seizures, can cause some pretty serious symptoms um, that, that can be fatal. Um, at lower doses, usually it's vomiting, diarrhea, and gastrointestinal symptoms. But um, yeah, definitely, especially with, with darker chocolates, that's something to, to keep in mind. But even with milk chocolate, if they ingest a lot, a lot it'd be worth contacting somebody. Perfect. Um, and of course, if you guys have any other questions, feel free to chime in. Um, and also we always answer questions after Facebook Live too. So if you wanna post your questions to the channel, we'll make sure that Dr. Pinella can answer, answer those for you. Um, but I think that was a really great discussion and thank you for, for joining us no today problem. and talking about that. Um, we will be back on Facebook Live April 14th and I'm very excited for a topic. It's gonna be topic dermatitis and environmental allergies. Um, and we're gonna be going a little bit more in depth um, than most of you have probably um, gone and kind of information from your vet. We're kind of taking that to the next level. So it's a lot of concepts about atopic dermatitis and environmental allergies that you may not have heard of, but I think it helps bring everything together so you can really understand this extremely, extremely complicated disease. Um, but thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks, Wednesday at four o'clock.